You are listening to the Mens Rea Podcast, and this is the story of Sophie Toscan Duplantier. Sophie Toscan Duplantier was a French writer and documentarian. She was born in July of 1957 in Paris, France, to her parents Marguerite and Georges Bouniol. She was the eldest of two, having one brother, Bertrand. She was very close to her mother's sister, Marie Madeleine. She was described as an independent and vivacious young girl. After finishing school, she briefly went on to study law before realising that the law was not her passion. Her interest was more in literature and writing. She dropped out of university and then married her boyfriend at the time, Pierre, in June of 1980. She worked in a bookshop and helped to run her husband's family's video shop. On the 26th of March the following year, Sophie gave birth to her son, Pierre-Louis. Unfortunately, soon after the birth of her child, Pierre left Sophie and they were divorced two years later. Sophie worked a number of jobs and then began working in public relations. She met Daniel Duplantier in 1988. They had worked together and, although he was over 25 years her senior, they got on well. Initially, Sophie had been hesitant to start a relationship with him, as he held a high profile in their shared career area of directing. But once Daniel had completed the separation from his wife that had been going on when they met, Sophie decided that she would give the relationship a go. They were married in June of 1990. She began working as an independent film producer, with Daniel's support. In 1991, she bought a home in rural County Cork. She had visited there when she participated in a student exchange during her high school years, and had fallen in love with the countryside, which resembled the area of France her family had come from before moving to Paris. She attended a party on the 20th of December 1996 with her husband, and the next day flew to her holiday home on her own. It was her first time visiting Cork by herself. The holiday home was remote, but situated next to two other houses in a cul-de-sac at the end of a private laneway. One of the other homes was also a holiday home, and the other was owned and occupied by a couple, Shirley Foster and Alfie Lyons. When Sophie arrived, having driven from Cork Airport in a rented car, Her caretaker and friend, Josephine Holland, had lit the two open fires and festooned the windowsills with holly to make the house look festive for her friend, as a Christmas present. Sophie rang Miss Holland and thanked her for the kind gesture, and she said she would call back later to make plans with her. When Sophie called again, Josephine was not there, and she left a message with her daughter. At 11.25 that evening, after Sophie had had time to relax, her friend Agnes Thomas rang from France. They talked for about 20 minutes, and then Sophie retired to bed for the night. The next day, Sophie drove into the nearest town, Skull, where she picked up supplies, browsed the shops amongst the Christmas shoppers, and had some tea. She withdrew 200 Irish punts from the bank and then returned home in the early evening, at around 4pm. On Saturday the 22nd of December, Sophie drove towards Mizzen Head and went for a walk. She then visited a French couple that she was friends with. On her way home, she stopped at the waterfront bar, run by the O'Sullivans. Sophie often liked to stop in there, and she had a cup of tea with the O'Sullivans, They invited her to drinks for Christmas, but Sophie didn't accept. She had booked return flights for the 23rd and the 24th of December, so whichever day she left, she would not be in Cork on Christmas Day. When Sophie returned home, she rang her friend Agnes Thomas again and left a message wishing her a happy birthday. She eventually got in touch with Josephine Holland and arranged to meet her the next day to take care of some business they needed to attend to. In addition to taking care of some bills the next day, Josephine said she would arrange to have Pat Hegarty, a local builder, come by to see about doing some renovation work on one of the fireplaces in the house. Sophie spoke to her husband Daniel at about 11pm that night before going to bed. She slept in a guest bedroom that night. It had been made up by Josephine because she thought that Sophie was visiting with her cousin. The room was warmer being just above the kitchen and also had an electric heater in it should Sophie get cold during the night. On the morning of the 23rd of December, Shirley Foster, Sophie's neighbour, got into her car and drove towards the gate that was shared by the three homes on the main road. When she arrived at the gate, she also came upon the gruesome remains of her neighbour. Sophie was lying next to the gate and fence, and was covered in blood. Shirley returned to her home, shaken, and called the emergency services. It was ten past ten in the morning. The first guardie arrived on the scene at ten forty and began establishing a crime scene. Sophie's body was a short distance from the gate, lying face up and partially caught on some barbed wire fencing. She was wearing a white t-shirt and leggings, and her navy dressing gown was strewn nearby. She had cuts all over her arms and hands, and her face had been struck badly. There was a cement block nearby that was thought to be the murder weapon. There was blood on the gate, suggesting that Sophie had been trying to escape from her attacker, and she was also grasping a clump of hair, suggesting that she had fought back. Josephine arrived at noon, as had been discussed with Sophie the night before, 
She had had no idea what had happened, and at first thought that there had been some awful accident when she saw the guards gathered round the gate to Sophie's house. They informed her that the death had been suspicious, and brought her into the house when they ascertained who she was, to see if there was anything unusual or out of place in the house that she could see. There was nothing out of the ordinary. All looked as it should be within the house. That evening, the forensics team arrived. Everything was photographed, the scene and each item in it. The surrounding areas were searched for evidence, and the house was examined for fingerprints and DNA. Everything would have to remain untouched until the chief pathologist could examine the scene, and he wasn't available until the next day. Meanwhile, in France, no one had yet been notified of Sophie's death, despite the news airing that a French woman had been found dead in County Cork. The Gardie had passed on the information to the French authorities, but the notification had not yet been made when Sophie's mother saw the report and immediately felt that something had happened to Sophie. Her family tried calling the authorities in Ireland, but no one could release any information to them. Eventually, Sophie's cousin rang Josephine Holland, who reluctantly confirmed that Sophie was no longer alive. The next morning, Christmas Eve, the chief pathologist, Dr. John Harbison, arrived and Sophie's body was removed to Cork City for a post-mortem. He found that Sophie had died due to a skull fracture caused by blunt force trauma. The inquest would be on hold, awaiting the results of a murder inquiry. Sophie's parents and siblings travelled to Cork to identify her body. Her husband couldn't identify her, he didn't want that to be his last memory of her. After identification, her body was transported back to France and she was buried on the 29th of December, near her home. The investigation began and an incident room was set up in Bantry Garda Station, one of the larger towns in the area. An investigation into Sophie's movements was conducted. The CCTV from the airport was pulled and reports of sightings were put together to create a minute-by-minute -minute timeline of Sophie's last days in Cork. Statements were taken from witnesses who saw her. Her family were interviewed and it was confirmed by them and the CCTV that Sophie was travelling and staying alone in the house. Her telephone records were requested and each person that had been called or that Sophie had received a call from was spoken to. This list was short. Her husband, Pat the Handyman, her friend in France, and Josephine Holland. Each call was accounted for, and each had an innocuous explanation. The mileage on her rental car was checked, and the miles driven since her pickup at the airport corresponded with the relatively short trip she had taken around West Cork in those two days. Nothing unusual there, either. The Gardaí were still looking for a weapon, suspecting that the concrete block was not the only item that Sophie had been hit with, although it was certainly what had delivered the fatal blows. In a statement, one of the leading Gardaí assured the public that there was no sign of sexual assault, and that there was no sign of forced entry on the house. The front door was still locked, and nothing within the house was disturbed. Forty police officers were assigned to the case, questionnaires were handed out, and door-to-door -door inquiries were made. A number of people gave hair samples at the request of Gardaí, and some clothes were taken away for analysis. Alibis for a number of people were checked. In February of 1997, a man and a woman were arrested under Section 4 of the Criminal Justice Act, and held for questioning in relation to the case for 12 hours before being released. The hair in Sophie's hand turned out, after testing and analysis, to be her own. It was reported that a man was seen in the area washing his boots in a small stream at about 4am in the morning, the night Sophie was killed, and although the weapon that the Gardaí were looking for had not been found, they were building up circumstantial evidence in the case. In January of 1998, the man was held for a second time at Bandon Garda Station, and questioned in relation to the death of Sophie Toscan du Plantier. He was again released without charge. In September of 2000, two women were arrested and questioned on separate dates, both released again without charge. That same month, it was reported that two tourists had heard the story of Sophie's killing from a man that they had met in a pub. They were uneasy at the length of the conversation and the depth that he went into, and reported the conversation to the Gardaí. Very early into the investigation, criticisms of the investigation itself came to the fore, even going so far as to being put to the Minister of Justice in the National Parliament, the Dole. However, the crime scene had been maintained and attended by Gardaí until the removal of the body, and the only people to touch Sophie's body were the doctor who pronounced her dead the morning of the murder and the state pathologist the next morning. There were criticisms particularly of the delay in getting the chief pathologist to West Cork, but it's unlikely that this would have had any great effect on his conclusions, as the weather was so cold at the time that it would have preserved Sophie's body and any forensic evidence from deterioration. In Ireland, the Gardaí prepare a file of their investigation, which is then sent to the Office of the Director for Public Prosecutions, who deals with all criminal matters being brought by the state. Two separate files have been brought to the DPP in relation to Sophie's case, one as large as some 2,000 pages, and as of yet, no charges have been laid down. French authorities were quick to want to get involved in the investigation into Sophie's death, but they were not granted access to the investigation file in the years just after Sophie's death, as it was thought that this might prejudice any criminal action taken further down the line. Blood samples taken from tiny drops of blood by the back door were sent to the US and the UK to be tested for DNA, 
but the results were inconclusive, and it appeared that the blood was in fact Sophie's. In 2002, a major reinvestigation of the case took place, undertaken by Dublin Metro Regional Headquarters. It's thought that no major failings have been found with the original investigation, particularly in relation to forensics, the preservation of the crime scene, and the taking of witness statements. Another file was sent to the DPP regarding their findings. In the quiet rural setting of West Cork, the lack of hard facts coming out regarding the case led to rumours, rumours that were then reported in the tabloids. One said that Sophie must have known her killer. The door was locked from the inside. She must have let her killer into the house. It was reported that there were two wine glasses out that had been used. This was widely reported as true, but it's not the case. Two of the chairs in Sophie's kitchen were pulled close together. This was interpreted as being indicative of Sophie having an affair and two people sitting very closely, intimately together. Again, this was widely reported. It's more likely, however, that Sophie had sat on one chair and had her legs on the other. The chairs were pulled together and placed close to the heater in the room. It's reported that this was her custom when reading in the kitchen of her chilly cork home. Many interpreted the uncertainty about the date of Sophie's return to France as an indicator that she was divorcing Daniel. By all accounts, however, the Duplantes' marriage was in a good place at the time of Sophie's death. They had in the past had their troubles and separated. Sophie even visited her skull home with another man on at least one occasion. But Sophie and Daniel were happy in the run-up to Christmas of 1996, and Sophie had even talked about her desire to have another child with Daniel. Each year, members of Sophie's family, her parents, her sibling, and some of her extended family return to West Cork for a mass that is set in Sophie's memory, in Galeen Church near Skull. The speculation in the papers after Sophie's death focused on her private life, and, as is all too frequent, what she might have been doing that made her a target. The other coverage focused on the man and woman who had been arrested and held for questioning in relation to the murder, Ian Bailey and his partner Jules Thomas. Ian Bailey was born in Manchester, in northwestern England, and came from a middle-class family. He went to university where he studied journalism and worked in print media for a number of publications, first in Gloucester and then in Cheltenham. He married a fellow journalist, but they eventually separated. In 1991, he moved to West Cork and he began working in a fish factory and as a gardener. It was in the factory that he met Jules Thomas and they began a relationship shortly after. He moved in with Jules and her children. By early 1996, Ian Bailey was beginning to re-establish himself as a journalist in West Cork and got in touch with local newspapers. When Sophie's body was discovered, the Cork Examiner contacted Bailey, as he was local to the crime, to help arrange coverage of the story for their newspaper. He supplied contacts and information to the West Cork correspondent, reporter Eddie Cassidy. Seven years after the murder of Sophie Toscan Duplantier, Ian Bailey sued eight newspapers for libel due to the printing of stories relating to him and his links to the crime. He claimed that the papers had branded him a murderer, and that this had destroyed his career as a journalist and his reputation in West Cork. He insisted that he was not taking the case in order to make money, but in an attempt to reclaim his reputation and to have it made clear that he was not responsible for Sophie's death. On Monday the 8th of December 2003, the libel hearing against the eight publications began in Cork Circuit Court, which was being temporarily housed in a warehouse while renovations were taking place on the Washington Street Courthouse. The choice of the Circuit Court was an interesting one. Bailey could have opted to have the case heard in the High Court, where there would have been no real limit on the amount of damages that could have been awarded to him, should he be successful in his claim. But instead, Bailey chose to take the case to the lower, circuit court, limiting his damages and ensuring that the case would be adjudicated by a judge only, rather than a judge and jury, as would have been the case in the High Court. Special arrangements had to be made within the courtroom to accommodate the press that had gathered to report on the libel hearing, in addition to accommodating the reporters who had been subpoenaed to give evidence of their work in relation to the death of Sophie Duplantier and the questioning of Ian Bailey. The eight newspapers were also well represented by a large legal team. The case began with legal submissions. The defence team wanted to access the state's files on the Duplantier murder. The state also appeared in order to make submissions, though it wasn't involved in the proceedings per se. They objected to Garda being called as witnesses and allowing access to the case file, as it may impinge on any trial that might subsequently take place in the matter. Newspapers submitted a letter from the DPP stating that while the case was open, there was no plans to take such a case. There were no plans to charge anyone. The defence won, and access to portions of the state's files would be granted. This included some of Ian Bailey's diaries. In his opening statement, counsel for Ian Bailey pointed to the articles referring to him and the investigation surrounding him in the Sophie Toscan Duplantier murder and asserted that these had ruined his life. He was branded as a murderer in the media and because of this it had ruined his reputation in his own community. He had experienced trial by media, though he had never even been charged with the murder in question. The lawyers for the defence, the newspapers, stated that Ian Bailey was the only suspect and person of interest in the investigation of Duplantier's death. They claimed that he was a very violent man and that he himself had courted media attention following his questioning. 
Bailey's counsel then took to his feet again and outlined the nature of the coverage of Bailey in the press. It took over an hour. When he was finished, Ian Bailey was called to the stand. He described how he and Jules had met in the fish factory in Skull and how he had become involved in the coverage of the Sophie Toscan du Plantier murder so quickly after it had occurred. He insisted that he had only seen Sophie once, 18 months before her death, when a neighbour had pointed her out to him, and he had never spoken to her. When Eddie Cassidy from the Cork Examiner called him, he was preparing a turkey for the family's Christmas dinner in two days' time. He was sent to the location, apparently not knowing the manner of death he was investigating, only that someone had been found dead. He and Jules took some photos, and after asking the guardie present at the scene what was going on, and getting no answers, they headed to the local post office to see what they could find. They managed to find out a name, Sophie Bunyol. Sophie was known locally by her maiden name. The next day, Bailey was on the stand again and described his first arrest by the guardie for questioning relating to the murder. He described how initially the guards had been friendly, despite his shock at being arrested, but once he got into the squad car, he said that the atmosphere completely changed and that the tone became hostile and he was bombarded with questions and allegations. He felt that the guardie were trying to frighten him into admitting to the murder. He said that the guardie even went so far as to threaten him. He went on to say that the guards had taken a long route to the station and that when he arrived, the place was mobbed with journalists. Photographs were taken of him being led into the station in handcuffs. He alleged that he was subject to further threats and was told that there was a cast iron case against him, that everyone believed that he had killed Sophie, including Jules. He was strip searched and DNA and hair samples were taken from him. The next day he was named in the Irish Sun newspaper as the man who had been arrested and they ran a photograph of him alongside the story. He discussed his second arrest in January of 1998 and described how the two arrests and the press coverage after each resulted in Bailey feeling sick to his stomach and that he had lost his presumption of innocence. He also discussed the interview he gave following the arrests to a journalist who said it would be a sympathetic piece, hoping that he could dispel some of the negative press. His lawyers also discussed with him some other arrests, as they knew the defence for the newspapers would surely bring them up. He had been arrested in 1996 and 2001 for assaulting Jules Thomas. He said that these incidents had occurred in the course of fights that he and Jules had had, and that he deeply regretted them. On cross-examination, he was indeed asked about these incidents, and it was put to him that the incidents were more than the indiscretions that he had described. Jules suffered bite wounds, required eight stitches to her mouth, and had clumps of hair pulled from her head on one occasion. Bailey agreed that the assaults were appalling, but went on to say that the fights had occurred after he had been drinking, and that he wasn't a violent man. He had never intended to hurt Jules. On the third day of the hearing, the defence was still focused on the violent incidents that took place between Bailey and Ms. Thomas. Counsel described a point in 2001 when Bailey had hit her with a crutch, and then he turned to evidence from Bailey's diaries. Bailey had written about the fights, saying, quote, something was badly wrong, end quote, with him, that he made her feel, quote, death was near, end quote. Two weeks after an attack in 1996, he stated in the diary that he, quote, actually tried to kill her, end quote. Bailey argued that he was a writer and that these passages shouldn't be taken literally and that what had been read in court was fictionalised. Bailey insisted that just because there had been incidents of domestic violence towards Jules didn't mean that he had killed Sophie. The next day, the fourth of the hearing was attended by even more press and public than the previous days had attracted, due in part to the coverage of Ian Bailey's diary entries. Bailey himself was beginning to feel the strain and told the judge that he was having difficulty sleeping and was tired. As the cross-examination of Bailey continued, his lawyers protested at the lengths the defence was going to and complained that the defence had never said that they were going to state that Bailey had committed the crime. The judge agreed and stated that they must be careful to ensure that the hearing didn't turn into an inquiry into the murder of Sophie Toscan du Plantier. Despite this, he was met with evidence that he had admitted to carrying out the murder. He replied that he had just been repeating the rumours that were circulating in West Cork at the time, and that this was not to be taken as an admission of guilt. He had admitted responding, oh yes, when Helen Callanan, a news editor at the Sunday Tribune, told him that people were saying he was the murderer, and that he reiterated this conversation with Miss Callanan to Yvonne Ungerer, a local woman. He said that he had replied in jest, and that he wasn't taking the allegations seriously at the time. They discussed Richard and Rose Shelley, who would later take the stand, insistent that Bailey had confessed to them. Bailey said that he could understand why they might have been convinced that he was the killer. He said that he had repeated to them what he described as the mantra that the police had repeated to him. I did it, I did it, I went too far. When the Shelleys took the stand in the second week of the trial, they were insistent that he had been serious, and had in fact made the couple so uncomfortable that they left the Bailey Thomas house much earlier than they had planned, in order that they might get away from Bailey. In relation to a schoolboy who had alleged that Bailey had confessed to him, Bailey responded that he had given the 14-year-old Malachi Reed a lift home and again had merely repeated the rumours that were going around about him. The defence's lawyers also put it to Bailey that he had knowledge of the crime before it had actually occurred and had said early on the 23rd, before the news had broken about Sophie's murder, that a murder had taken place. Bailey insisted that those people simply had their times wrong and that he had done no such thing. 
It was also put to him that he had in fact courted publicity after his first arrest by granting interviews to both the national TV station and the national radio station, and that in that interview he had said that it was reasonable that he be regarded as a suspect due to the scratches he had on his arms. On the fifth day of the hearing, Bailey claimed that witnesses were attempting to intimidate him in the courthouse and that some sort of guard operation to interfere with his case was going on, that the guardi were attempting to frame him for the murder of Sophie Duplantier. The judge warned Bailey that this was a defamation action, however, and nothing more. Ian Bailey finally, after nearly four days, left the witness stand. Bailey's solicitor then gave evidence regarding a letter from the solicitor of a local woman and shopkeeper, Marie Farrell, for Bailey to cease and desist contact with her. She claimed that Bailey was intimidating her. He advised his client to steer clear of the woman. He also described the hordes of journalists that descended after Bailey's arrests in 1997 and 1998. Jules Thomas's mother and then her daughter Saffron took the stand. Saffron described the effect that the coverage had had on her family and described how the local people had begun avoiding the whole family. Then Jules herself took the stand. It was late Friday afternoon by the time she was sworn in as a witness, so the court only heard about her background, that she had come to Ireland in 1973, and that she was a painter, that she had met Bailey while he was working at a fish factory, and eventually they began a relationship. They only briefly discussed the incidents of domestic violence before court was adjourned for the weekend. On Monday morning, the 15th of December, the court briefly heard from two other witnesses who described a dramatic change in Ian Bailey after the media coverage marked him as the prime suspect in the Sophie Duplantier case. Thomas Brosnan, a Skull businessman, and Brendan Houlihan, a newsagent from Skibbereen. Mr. Houlihan noted, quote, if you believe what you read in the papers, you would more or less say he was convicted, end quote. He also described the hush that would come over his customers if Ian Bailey entered his shop. After the two gentlemen had given their testimony, Jules Thomas resumed the witness box. She described the effects of the media coverage on her and her family's lives, and how she felt they were being sabotaged by the press. She described being under siege by journalists after her arrest and questioning in February of 1997. She echoed what Bailey had said about some sort of police conspiracy to frame Bailey, and insisted that the statement that she had made to the guardie describing the night of Sophie's murder was incorrect. She asserted that Bailey had gotten up and spent most of the night writing in the kitchen. She denied that when he returned to bed he was tossing and turning, or that he was cold, as if he had been outside. She brushed off the incidents of domestic violence that she had endured, blaming them variously on alcohol and alcohol mixed with strong pain medication that Bailey was taking at the time of the 2001 attack. Tuesday the 16th of December was the seventh day of the trial and saw testimony from the Shelleys and Malachy Reed, alongside that of neighbours, former colleagues and friends of Bailey. The Shelleys spoke about the night that they had attended a party at Bailey and Thomas's home on New Year's Eve 1998. They had been invited back after being in a pub with them and were surprised to realise that they were the only other couple in the house that night. Bailey had talked constantly about the murder and eventually threw his arms around Mr. Shelley and said, quote, I did it, I did it, I went too far. The Shelleys assumed that he was referring to the murder given that that was what he had been talking about all night. Mrs. Shelley testified that she was frightened by Bailey's bizarre behaviour, his incessant talking about the murder and then showing him a file that he'd kept with what looked to be all the articles written about the crime in it. She was so frightened that they left the house before the lift that they were waiting for arrived. Malachy Reed took the stand as a 21-year-old man and recounted how, when he was 14 years old, he had taken a lift from Ian Bailey. He was friends with Jules Thomas's youngest daughter, Fernella. He said that Bailey had seemed agitated and had been drinking when he got into the car and that Bailey went on to tell him about how he had bashed in Sophie's head. Malachy sat in silence for the rest of the short trip, not knowing what else to say. He tried to put it out of his mind, but eventually he told his mother the next day, who noticed that he had been upset and agitated. She feared for their safety afterwards and made sure to lock the house up tightly every night from then on. Alfie Lyons, Sophie's neighbour, also testified that day, but not about the murder as you might think. He swore that he had introduced Sophie to Ian some 18 months before her death, when she called by the house when Ian was carrying out some gardening work for him. Another journalist who was based in France at the time of the murder gave evidence that Ian Bailey had stated that he was well-placed to provide information for stories about the murder as he, Bailey, had known the victim, spoken to her before and had even seen her the day before she died. On the eighth day of the trial, Marie Farrell took the stand. She had given a statement to the Gardaí recounting how, in the early hours of the 23rd of December, she had seen a tall man walking in a distinctive manner along a road near to Sophie's house. She later saw the same man in a shop and was told that it was Ian Bailey. She was firm in the matter that she had seen Ian Bailey in the vicinity of Sophie Toscan de Plantier's home on the night that she died. She recounted how both Ian Bailey and Jules Thomas had tried to get her to retract her statement, and she had been living in fear, so much so that she felt unable to be in her shop alone for fear that they would come in and harass her. She had instructed her solicitor to write a cease and desist letter to Ian Bailey in an attempt to stop the harassment. Peter Balecki, a former friend of Bailey's, was called to give testimony regarding one of the incidents of domestic violence. He had been called to Jules Thomas's house by her daughter Virginia after Bailey had assaulted Jules. 
He got emotional as he described how he found Jules curled up on her bed, crying and moaning in pain, and he saw the scratches, bruises, black eye, and clumps of her hair that were missing that Bailey had inflicted. He agreed to drive Jules to the hospital, as Bailey had refused to help her. He stayed with the family for three weeks after the incident. The closing statements took place on the ninth and tenth days of the hearing. The newspaper's legal team argued that Ian Bailey had been labelled as a violent man, who had been arrested in relation to the Sophie Toscan du Plantier case and was the prime suspect in her killing, all of which were true statements, therefore no defamation had occurred. Bailey's lawyers argued that the newspapers had labelled him as a murderer and that their accusations were unsupported. The ruling came the next month, on the 19th of January 2004, due to an all-too-common delay in the court diary. There was a crush of media covering the result, not just having come from Dublin, but from as far away as the UK and France. The judge found that none of the eight publications had defamed Bailey by saying that he was a violent man and that he was the prime suspect in the murder. He did, however, find the Irish Mirror and the Irish Sun had defamed on a subsidiary issue, claiming that Bailey had been violent towards his ex-wife, which was unsubstantiated. Total damages awarded to Bailey was €8,000. But later in February, he was found liable for €200,000 in costs for the newspapers and his own legal costs and his award of 8000 was frozen until such a time as Bailey indicated how he was going to pay for the expensive court case. Bailey appealed this decision to the High Court for review, but the case was settled out of court. In 2005, Marie Farrell contacted lawyers for Ian Bailey and said that she had been coerced into giving a false statement by the Gardaí, who knew that she was with a man that was not her husband on the night of the 23rd of December, 1995. She retracted her statement, which led to a review of the initial investigation and another file being sent to the Director of Public Prosecutions. The DPP decided no case would be brought at that time, and they decided to send the investigation file to the French authorities. French authorities can investigate crimes involving French citizens outside of France, and so they began their own investigation based on the file that the DPP had sent to them. A European arrest warrant was issued for Ian Bailey in 2010, and the High Court ordered his surrender to France. The Supreme Court overruled this, however, in 2012. Just before the Supreme Court issued its verdict in 2012, Bailey's lawyers received a report on the case from the DPP's office, which was very critical of the investigation and seemed to support Bailey's claims of a Garda conspiracy to frame him. Irish government cooperation with the French authorities in terms of investigations was halted for the duration of Bailey's new High Court claim and due to the state-level inquiry into the illegal recording of phone calls made to and from police stations in Cork that were revealed during the discovery process by the defence in Bailey's case. In March of 2015, Ian Bailey took a civil case in the Irish High Court against the state and the police service for wrongfully arresting him and for conspiracy while trying to frame him for murder. Martin Graham alleged that the Gardaí gave him money, clothes and cannabis to induce him to befriend Ian Bailey and get him to talk about the Duplantier murder. A central part to Bailey's claim was that the Gardaí had intimidated Marie Farrell into giving a false statement to them placing Bailey near the crime scene on the night of the murder. This time, she testified on behalf of Bailey, but she seemed confused on the stand and the state's lawyers were able to poke holes in her testimony, making her seem unreliable at best in her recall. After 64 days, most of Bailey's claims were struck out as the statute of limitations had passed for everything bar the claim of conspiracy. It was the longest running civil case in Ireland to date. The jury held against him on the count of conspiracy after only two hours of deliberation and again Bailey decided to appeal his case to a higher court. The Court of Appeal heard Bailey's case in March of 2017 and it has reserved judgment until a later date. Meanwhile, the French authorities have been investigating the murder of Sophie. In August 2016, Ian Bailey wrote to the Director of Public Prosecutions and asked that they liaise with the French authorities to ascertain if the DPP could bring charges against him in order that he can clear his name in Ireland. Days after his appeal was heard, Bailey appeared in the Central Criminal Courts, where a European arrest warrant issued by French authorities was endorsed by a judge, and he was arrested for the murder of Sophie Toscan du Plantier. Shortly after his arrest, there was a bail hearing and Bailey was released. His legal team told the court that they will oppose his removal from the state to France, but this is unlikely to make a difference as he can be tried in his absence in France. Since this episode was released in June of 2017, a podcast distributed by Audible was released on the Sophie Toscan du Plantier case called West Cork. This is absolutely not an ad for it or for Audible, but I have to say that if this case has taken your interest, West Cork is a must listen. The researchers and producers have gotten access to pretty much everyone involved in this case, and their interviews are riveting. I'd go and listen if you haven't already. Thank you for listening to the Mens Rea podcast. If you like what you heard, you can subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts or whatever podcast app you use. You can find us on Facebook or Twitter at Mens Rea Pod, or shoot me an email to mensreapod at gmail.com. Thanks as always to our supporters on Patreon and those who support by reviewing and recommending the podcast on social media. Our theme song is Quinn Song First Dance by Kevin MacLeod. This podcast is researched, written, and produced by me, your host, Sinead. All sources used for today's episode can be found in the show notes or on our website, www.mensreapod.com. Till next time, don't do anything I wouldn't do.
On the eighth day of the trial, Marie Farrell took the stand. Oh my 